So I'd like to read for you a scripture which is uh, not a scripture usually here on Christmas Day, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of Easter scripture, and um, it, uh, it's a scripture that uh, uh, in some ways frames what it is that we want to talk about today, which is the message is called After Bethlehem. And so if you'd rise, please, I'm going to read this for you. It's, it's from John 20, and it's the Thomas story, beginning in verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means the same thing, one of the, which means twin, by the way, uh, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas this time was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side and stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be seated. So uh, what happened to the shepherds after... Bethlehem. Last night, remember, we were uh, we were walking through that uh, uh, that last part of the of the story in which the shepherds go to Bethlehem. As a matter of fact, of those of you who who weren't here, what we were talking about is that you need to take a step. That lots of times Christmas ends with the angels singing for for people, it, you know, with the with the spectacle and with the light, and it it doesn't ever get them to the place where they actually see Jesus, which is Bethlehem. I was wondering when I when I did this slide. By the way, this is an aside. Whether kids ever make those Bethlehem pictures anymore, where you where you you know use crayons and you go two layers and then you scratch out the, you know. I couldn't find one. I was looking for one like that, but I couldn't find it somewhere. That's Bethlehem. That's not Bethlehem, actually. This is the way Luke tells the story. Sorry, I'm, that was absolutely distracting. Um, <laughs> it's Christmas morning, uh, so. So when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, this is the way Luke tells the story, um, the, the shepherds said one to another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And then it, um, it, it, it turns to, the, the account turns to Mary and it said that Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. Which is Luke's way, Luke's a very clever writer, I think. It's Luke's way of saying to us, you want to know the source I have for all this? You know, I've been telling you all these stories, where I got these stories from? The answer is from Mary. She was the one who remembered, who treasured them, made a, 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 a kind of a memory bank of them, and then pondered them, thought about them, thought them through. And then comes this. When they, that this is the shepherds, had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And they returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. You notice the word return? It's a, in the Greek, it's a kind of odd word. It, it actually means literally to turn under, and it can mean to go home. It's sometimes used in context where it means to go home. It's not used very frequently in the New Testament. But, but it also can mean to go back to where you were. And I think that's Luke's clue to us, his cue to us, that as a matter of fact, that's what happened. What happened is that the shepherds went home. They returned. To their old way of life. You know what happens? Something spectacular happens. 
And, and you, you think about it for a while and you say, that's going to be absolutely transformative of my life. And then you go home and, and, and pretty soon you, you walk in the door and you need to do the dishes and, um, and, and other things need to get done. And pretty soon you're back into your old life and you remember that great event, but somehow you can't bring it into the life that you have. I think that's what must have happened to the shepherds. Some of you might know Annie Dillard as a writer, Annie Dillard. There's a, she has a wonderful little book, um, 20 or 30 years old now, called Teaching a Stone to Talk. And in that, it's a set of essays, kind of Annie Dillard style essays, which are often meditations on, on themes. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff in there about the church and so forth. And in one of those essays, she talks about a total eclipse. Now, I, I've never seen a total eclipse. Have you seen a total eclipse? I've seen partial eclipses. But Annie Dillard says that uh, a, a partial eclipse is to a total eclipse, like riding in an airplane compared to jumping out of an airplane. She said it's frightening. It's, it's, you know, all those things you see from antiquity about how people were very, they were, they were absolutely stunned and frightened by total eclipses. It's still true. She, she and her husband uh, went to a place in eastern Washington State near Yakima to watch this total eclipse. They found a, a hill. They went up on top of the hill. And when the shadow, you know, there's this shadow line of darkness, this darkness line came sweeping through at an enormous rate of speed, people screamed it was so stunning and then it was over now what do you do they got in their car and they drove down the hill and they had breakfast she says the mind wants all eternity the body on the other hand is satisfied with an egg over easy It's what we're like, right? It's what we're like. We're, we're, human beings are these two things, these two things which seem sometimes feel in, con, in contrast to each other, in contradiction with each other. The, on the one hand, we're the, we, we aspire to, uh, to glory. We aspire to be something greater. We aspire to the heavens. On the other hand, we are people of the earth. And so the shepherds, saw the angels, went to Bethlehem, looked in the eyes of the child. And then they went home. And they waited. Thirty long years, huh? I mean, if they were middle-aged, they would be into old age by the time these 30 years were up. If they were young, they would still be in middle age by the time. Nothing, nothing. They heard nothing for a long time. And then they heard some rumors from, from up north, from Nazareth. And they would say to each other, if they still knew each other, they would say to each other, you know, wasn't that family from Nazareth? And they would hear the name Jesus and they would say, Joshua in Hebrew, they would say, they would say, wasn't, wasn't his name Joshua? And they would listen to the rumors and the rumors would say two things about this man who was up there in, in Galilee preaching and healing. And that one thing they would say is that, is that he had powers, real powers. He, he had the powers of, 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 of miracle. He had the power of healing. He had the power to frame the, the dream, the gospel in a whole new way. He had powers, but at the same time, he looked nothing like a king. And they would wonder, ponder those things, you know. Do you ever, you ever think about the earthly ministry of Jesus. The, the church has had a terrible track record of skipping over the earthly ministry of Jesus as if it really didn't matter. I mean, we read Paul and we read the rest of the New Testament and somehow we don't spend enough time in the Gospels with, with, with Jesus. 
with the Sermon on the Mount, with, with, with what he taught in the parables, with what he was doing in the healings. He was reframing the dream. The dream, which had been framed in terms of David, and David was a king like other kings, and, and in terms of, of, of a land, a, a place, and now he was reframing the dream in ways that said the dream has to go beyond the land, and it has to go beyond kingship of, of that kind. It's a new kingdom that he proclaimed. He, he would say things like, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, he would say, so, you know, you love those who love you back? You love your family? You think that's great? Everybody does that. Everybody loves their family. Everybody loves those who love them back. You know how you know that you're my disciples? You love people who don't love you back. It's a, it's, it's a transformative teaching, and part of the transformation is that it's a it's a new way of imagining and understanding and seeing the great dream which runs all the way through Scripture. And so the shepherds would have heard the teaching and wondered about it and thought about it. And then the most stunning thing happened. You, you, you know what happened. He died. He, he was executed, actually, on a Roman cross as a political prisoner. He was put up on a cross, which is, the crosses were designed to display dead bodies and, and to make the message that if you mess with Rome, if you mess with power, if you mess with, with who we are, this is where you end up. And the, the, the way... Coming into Jerusalem was sometimes lined with crosses with people on them so that as you came to Jerusalem, the message was very clear, don't mess with Rome, with power. End of hope. End of Christmas, you know, when you think about it. Isn't this sort of where the story ends for those shepherds? I mean, they go to Jerusalem, they go to, go to Bethlehem, they, they, they see the child, they think this child is going to become the king, this child who, who has been prophesied by the prophets and who has been announced by the angels, and, and, and the child grows up, and then the child dies. Where Thomas comes in, Thomas followed Jesus. He listened to Jesus even in terms of Jesus redefining the dream, but yet he's not ready when Jesus dies, and, and for him it's the end of hope, and he is unwilling to get his hope stirred up again. It's too risky. He's not going to go down that road again. He says, unless I see the wounds, I will not believe that he's come back. It is, I think, for many people, even people in churches, even people like you and me in a place like this, it is in some ways the end of hope because what happens to Christianity at this point is that it begins to shift from a faith which has in mind the, the dream of Jesus, the dream of a new kingdom, the dream of a new heavens and a new earth, the dream of, of resurrection, the dream of going beyond death, the dream of overcoming the difficulties in the world, the dream of peace on earth. All of those Christmas dreams get lost, and instead what we do is we make it into a religion of escape. To, uh, thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> I couldn't find the right slide. Jonathan did. Um, Christianity has become such an escapist religion. 
So we can live our life any way we want to here, you know. As if the earth doesn't matter. As if neighbors don't matter. As if people don't matter. Because one day we're going to fly away. Have you ever seen, have thought about the irony of of all of that in terms of Christmas? What is Christmas about? Christmas is about the fact that God has come down, that God has taken on flesh, that God so loved the earth that he came back. The the story, as it's framed in the scriptures, is a story that starts in Genesis 2 and 3, 1, 2, and 3, and and there God is walking in the garden. God is present on the earth. The garden is God's garden. And And then it's as if God walks out. And now he's come back, come down owned the earth, remaking the garden. You you get the idea across Scripture. And then we take that faith and we frame it in terms of flying away, getting rid of this. We don't care about the earth. We want to go up to heaven. Have you ever noticed that even in heaven in the New Testament, the New Testament doesn't talk a lot about heaven, but when it does, it talks about heaven as a place of longing. Remember that passage in Revelation? The souls under the altar? And what do they say? How long, O Lord? How long before the dream? How long before it's here? We have have emptied the faith of its breath and its glory and, and, and we've made of it something which is escapist instead of something which is alive. God, come down. And then, and then they would have heard the story. They would have heard the story that Jesus came back. That death didn't hold him, that the tomb didn't hold him. That as a matter of fact, when he came back, he came back. And not only does he come back, and this is absolutely crucial in that Thomas story, he comes back with the wounds. Have you thought about Jesus with the wounds? He goes to Thomas and he says, look at my hands. Put your your fingers in my hands. Look at the wound on my side. It's as if God has taken all of our suffering. Well, what does the cross represent? The cross represents, not, not represents too weak a word. The cross is God owning the suffering of the world. Jesus taking into himself and on himself the suffering of the world, all our suffering. And now he bears that suffering. And when he comes back, he comes back with the wounds. Which means that all that suffering matters, all of history matters. All those things that we think don't matter actually do matter. We are not running away from the woundedness of the earth. God is healing the woundedness of the earth, bringing us back together. That's the idea. There is a broadness of breath in our faith, a Christmas breath. This week in uh, New York Times, Nicholas Kristof um, uh, had an interview with Tim Keller, Tim Keller of Redeemer Presbyterian. Some of you might know him or have read his books. Um, And and, uh, uh, Nicholas Kristof comes into this interview talking to Tim Keller, the pastor, and he says to him um, that he's almost persuaded to be a Christian, but he has a few troubles with a few of the doctrines. And then he says this, and I, I, I pulled this out of the interview. What I admire most about Christianity is the amazing good work it inspires in people to do in the world. It inspires people to do in the world. True, right? 
Christians everywhere do good work. It, it is, it's a stunning fact about our faith. Why? Because we have a God who came down, and therefore, because we have a God who came down, we believe that this life and this earth and everything that goes on in it matters. The suffering of the earth matters. The wounds of Jesus matter. Everything matters. There is a breath to our faith which sometimes we lose. It's still there. Why? Because of Jesus. Because of Christmas. What does Christmas mean? It means that God said, this place, this earth, this life matters. And then, when it seemed like Christmas was over, God came back down. I, I, I've, I've had a theory for a long time that re religions have, in, at, their, at their greatest moment, at their best moments, religions have something of the character of their founder. And our founder is not Paul or Peter. Our founder is not uh, John Calvin or Martin Luther. Our founder is not the latest megachurch pastor where I've heard militarism preached, for example, just this week, I turned and saw some pastor of a megachurch preaching militarism. No, no. Our founder is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that we want to emulate. It is Jesus who is our Lord. It's Jesus who came down for us. And it is Jesus who said, this earth is so valuable that I will come and then when all the forces of evil said, no, no, you're not welcome here. There's no room in the inn. There's no room in the world for you. He comes back. That's Christmas. So, Christmas means that God came down. Easter means that God came back. And one day, one day God will come to stay. And that's my message for this morning. I could go on. There's lots of implications here. This has huge implications. But I want to end just with this passage from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is kind of where the Bible ends, you know. There's one more chapter, but this is where the Bible ends for the most part. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for, from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That's the message this morning. That Christmas is God coming down. Easter is God coming back. And the dream is of an earth where God dwells with all of us together. For that, let us pray. Lord God, help us to get how radical the scriptures are. The dream. The dream which you spent a great deal of time articulating and describing and redescribing because we don't get it and then we didn't get it and we didn't get it again. Help us this morning to get the dream. Help us this morning, Lord, to understand the meaning of Christmas. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.